The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. What are some of the highlights at the bishops' meeting in Baltimore? Well, uh, I don't know if you can call them highlights. To me, they're more like lowlights. Boys doing things that boys have always done. Drawing a picture of a weapon can now get you in trouble. We've got to treasure silence as the first language of God. I agree with St. Paul that even the pagans can know the truth. I wonder sometimes whether or not the postmoderns can know the truth. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKay of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, it's uh, still early January. Lots of folks who are on a college schedule are packing up to start the spring semester. And there are also high school seniors and their families thinking about making applications to college. And we've all heard the statistics. One of the best predictors for a young adult to lose their faith or stop practicing their faith is to go off to a college, whether secular or self-identified as Catholic. Our guest today has a lot to say about these matters. She is a graduate of Harvard University with a degree in theology and classics. She's worked at my alma mater, the Catholic University of America, who's sponsoring her to study business at Stanford University in California. And she is the author of the book, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard. Aurora Griffin, welcome to The Catholic Current. Hello, happy to be here. Uh, Aurora, how, how did this book come come to be? Did, I, I don't think it was something that you, you planned from the get-go as you were applying to Harvard, was it? It was not at all. It was not something I had planned on before, during, or immediately after Harvard. Uh, so I was doing my graduate degree in Oxford um, after graduation, and uh, it was Easter Sunday, and this idea just... It, it, it came to me for the first time and in full force. How I stayed Catholic at Harvard, uh, it'll be a, a guidebook for Catholic college students who want to keep their faith while they're, especially at secular, but at, at any university. And I ran to my computer as fast as I could. I sat down and I just started typing madly. And what I had a couple hours later was an outline of a book that I had never envisioned. Um, and I think the whole thing was just such uh, just pr- providence and inspiration. Um, it was written by Pentecost, uh, and well, the first draft anyway, it was done by Pentecost. And one thing after another just fell into place to be published uh, in September 2016. Well, we're glad that you were open to that prompting of the Holy Spirit to uh, to sit down and, and, and write that book. I think oftentimes uh, academics uh, second guess themselves and and then don't and then don't, don't respond that way. Now, some folks will say, "Hey, if you want to keep the faith, you know, t- take the the line of advice from from people who've grown up in hostile institutions. Just don't do anything to attract the guards' attention. Just keep your faith hidden, and that will keep it safe." What, what's your view on that? No, I think I think it does depend um, on what God is calling you to do when you're at college or in another secular environment. There, I certainly don't cast blame on people who are looking at today's situation and saying, I may really get in trouble for my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I, I would encourage people um, to think twice about the um, the tactic of not attracting attention. Uh you know, Robert George at Princeton really taught me this. Um, you have to speak up for the truth, whatever you think it is, because mm-hmm. it is, it's the right thing to do. Um, if it really is the truth and it's really going to help other people, then there is a kind of moral duty um, to talk about it as we're able to. 
And the other thing is strategically, um, you know, evil doesn't let us alone. We don't get to uh, make truces with it. Um, I was in London a, a few months ago and seeing the, the Churchill museums, and yes. everyone was telling Churchill, just, um, just make a deal with Hitler. He'll leave England alone if you can just let him do his thing. And at some point, he just had to say in, in the face of all of this advice, absolutely not. This is not... If, if I'm really looking at evil here, um, I, I do need to fight against it um, because it will not let, it, they're not going to leave us alone. Um, and I think that that, I think that's true on a spiritual level as well. If your plan oh, is Oh, I think that's a tremendously important point. Uh, you know, e- evil is never satisfied. Evil never says, oh, I, I, I've had enough. I, I couldn't possibly have one more soul. You just go ahead and, and live your life. And, and if we're not pushing forward, we're, we're falling backwards. And, and as I recall, you, you mentioned that at the beginning of your book, don't you? That there's no such thing as really staying Catholic. You're either progressing or you're regressing. I think that's absolutely true. And that's a decision every single day. What does that decision look like in, in your life now? Um, you know, much like it has for the last uh, 10 years, since I've been at different uh, universities living my Catholic life. It, it means um, as regular a prayer life as I can have. It means mm-hmm. getting to Mass as many times a week as I can. Um, mm-hmm. it, it means being, um, you know, faithful to the teachings of the church when they're not popular. Right. Well, I, I know that if you're a faithful Catholic and an academic environment of certainly the great majority of the ones that I, I've been exposed to over the years, either as a student or as a professor, if you're a faithful Catholic, you're certainly not likely to be invited to sit at the cool kids' table. And you, there's certainly not a lot of money and glamour involved in, in being a faithful Catholic. But I, I think... There's something different now. I, I mean, aren't we in a situation where we're just being Catholic or wearing a, a crucifix or, or a visible scapular could be considered hate speech or a microaggression? Hmm. You know, um, that that just hasn't been my experience. I definitely okay. hear, I, I worry about that when I read uh, a lot about what's going on other places, and I worry that we may get to a place where that's the case. I have to say, I uh, part of the um, the concession with how I stayed Catholic at Harvard is that it it, it kind of grabs your attention because people think, "Gosh, that must have been so hard, given what the the climate is like now." And I think the point I was trying to make is that you can stay Catholic at Harvard, you can stay Catholic anywhere, um, and people aren't necessarily as hostile about it as, as you would think they are. Um, if you're open about what you believe and you have charity, um, it really is hard to um, to come at you. You know, like it's it's. I don't know. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to belabor the point too much because I know that I was very fortunate in my experience. Okay. Okay. No, and, and some some people do have uh, harrowing stories uh, to to tell. W- one of the things that that I thought about it as as I read your book was you you seemed awfully busy uh, doing lots of different things, you know, on behalf of academics and as students would say, uh, having a life and also uh, living the faith. How did you end up not exhausted? Mm. I don't. Uh, I think I was pretty exhausted. Um, <laughs> no, that's. <laughs> I, uh, I I truly think that we are fed by the Eucharist in mm-hmm. as many ways as you can think of. Um, right. The times in my life where I've been able to make it to Mass every single day um, have been the happiest and most sustained, no matter what else is going on. And that's the truth. It's there for us to, to eat and to give us strength for the journey. Well, I, I think part of the challenge is that uh, very often people are raised to expect so little 
from the faith that you know you have to you have to warm a pew for 44 minutes once a week or something horrible will happen to you for reasons that no one can ever explain but the idea that you're you're being sustained or given a mission or or enriched uh, that doesn't that doesn't get communicated now when you were at Harvard you connected with focus missionaries too I did they started they came in uh, my sophomore year and they were one of the best things that happened to the Catholic community there. I can't possibly say enough good things about Focus. No, uh, Focus is a, a fellowship of Catholic university students, and they're recent college graduates. And they're kind of a Catholic version of the Evangelical Campus Crusade for Christ. They uh, they do Bible study. They promote Catholic fellowship. They try to make the sacraments available. And, and I've worked with uh, Focus in a variety of settings, and I've only had very, very positive uh, experiences with them. H- had you ever given any thought to um, to joining Focus? You know, I knew it wasn't my calling in particular, um, because when by the time I would have thought about applying to be a focused missionary, I had already um, committed to be in grad, graduate school. Okay. Um, so, but I do have friends from Harvard who did who ended up being focused missionaries, and I have really enjoyed um, staying in touch with them and supporting their mission and prayer and financially as I can. Uh, they're just. What a fantastic ministry. They're, they're a very sound organization who do good work on campus and off campus. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Aurora Griffin, author of the book, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now, one 511 5483 Text us at the same number, one 511 5483 After the show, you can download the audio as a podcast at thestationofthecross.com or most major platforms forms including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. Users of iCatholic Radio are leaving inspiring reviews in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Margie says, My go-to app. I love this channel. I can listen while busy around the house or driving in the car. I love the variety of programs. Keep up the good work. Michaela from New Zealand says, I love this app. I have it on Bluetooth in my car radio and listen to it all day, every day, and am encouraged in my Catholic faith. I would recommend this to the world, whether Christian or not, because it speaks to all people to become better people. I am now a huge follower of the American Catholic way of life because it's very similar to the way I was brought up in Fiji. The priests on the station are very straightforward, but are very understanding toward the audience at the same time. Love it, love it, love it. If you haven't reviewed iCatholic Radio yet, we'd love to hear from you. Visit our page at the iTunes or Google Play Store. Do you ever wonder where God is in your suffering or what His will is for you as you struggle in the faith? Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, a program to inspire you and offer solutions to many of life's challenges. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun whose humor and holiness, along with years of theological training, bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. That's Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion. So make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at the Station of the cross.com 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. We're talking today about keeping the faith while in college, and our guest is a graduate of Harvard, a Rhodes Scholar, now studying at Stanford University, and author of the book, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard. And Aurora Griffin and I, at the first segment, talked about how people lose the faith and how people might keep the faith while in school. In this segment, we're going to look at some of the challenges that college students face, students who want to remain faithful. And we're going to talk about intellectual, social, and and moral challenges. Aurora, I, I spent a lot of time as a professor of philosophy and theology. My big concern is with intellectual challenges. In in your studies and in, in your travels, have you encountered the assumption that if you're a faithful faithful Catholic, you can only be intelligent by by accident? That in, intelligence and faith, at best, have nothing to do with each other. At worst, cancel each other out. That is the the dogma of the university. <laughs> it okay. does. It seems to me that that people believe. Uh, it's not quite so bad that people think that if you're Catholic, you must be dim, but it is the case that people think, huh, that's a funny coincidence. You're smart, even though you're Catholic. Those things often don't go together. And, and of course, you're, you're a young... Right. And you're a young woman also, and the narrative is, if you're a young woman and you're smart, you certainly can't be Catholic. I, it, it, it may be even more true for women, yeah. Right. Right. So, when did you find these encounters in the classroom, or was it more in conversations uh, with classmates over coffee that you had these challenges? Mm-hmm. Um, both. So, I do remember um, being in the classroom a number of times, and no professor ever said anything, um, you know, overt like uh, overtly anti-Catholic. But there were just sort of assumptions. They would talk negatively about how backwards things were in the Middle Ages, right? Mm. And I think people don't realize um, that that was a time of tremendous uh, intellectual flourishing, especially within the Catholic Church. (laughs) Right. Um, So that, that really is a kind of a dig at us. Right. I mean, people who build Gothic cathedrals are obviously not living in caves, and, and they're not ju- just eating eating dirt as well. And there are a lot of assumptions that you know up uh, up until Columbus, you know, every Catholic thought that the world was flat, uh, et cetera, et, et cetera. What what are some of the the social challenges that a Catholic is likely to face on on a, on a campus? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there are a few different kinds, right? So uh, there's always going to be the the pull to live a sinful life. Um, College parties have a lot of stuff that would land you in a confessional. Sure. But there's, there's, I found at least at Harvard, the bigger challenge for me, I wasn't really attracted to um, that scene. That's not really where my friends were anyway. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I found just being so busy, having so many things, that could occupy my attention, uh, it was socially challenging to prioritize the faith. And, um, you know, the, the people who were getting together to pray on Friday night, um, to, to choose to go and, and pray with them and spend time with them meant that I was sacrificing other things. And yeah. that may be even a, a bigger challenge for the average college goer. Well, I know that a lot of folks go to college because uh, they, they see it as kind of the, the late adolescent spa, and it's a time to work vigorously on, on your social life and perhaps making your, your liver into a hard green rock. Uh, and then real life and adult life you know, starts after 22, 23, uh, 24. I, I think if you enter college with that kind of attitude, you're going to be almost defenseless against the invitations to do the things that would land you in the confessional the, the, the next morning. What, what were your purposes and expectations when you first left for higher education? 
Well, I knew that my faith was important to me. I had been raised uh, in a very solidly Catholic family. My family went to Mass every Sunday. They didn't miss. My dad taught me the catechism um, himself from the Baltimore Catechism. Uh, So it really was, um, it already was a very important part of my identity. Uh, I don't know that I anticipated prioritizing and growing in it in the way that I ended up doing that. I think that had something to do with the friends that I met and the fact that we all kind of became more serious about our faith throughout our time at college. Mm-hmm. Um, but my my intention was, at the very least, uh, to stay Catholic. And what I found was that if you have a serious intention to stay Catholic, that means you're going to grow in your Catholicism. But what we were saying before, if you're not growing, then uh, you're probably losing ground. And it's likely for people leaving college for the first time that they're, it's the first time they've had to take kind of an adult responsibility for their faith. I mean, mom and dad are not there to make sure that you get up on Sunday morning, et cetera, et cetera. There's no one there to prompt you to go to confession and so on. Or we just got a text from a listener that's approaching the, the question from a different angle. Our listener asks, is it worth going to college uh, at, at all? Uh, anymore. Some people would make the case that you know you can get endless number of great lectures online. Uh, you, if you just want to become uh, illuminated and well read, you can do that on your own and not have the opportunity cost of four, six, eight years in college and not have have a lot of debt. And it, you, I've seen mm-hmm. some of your your videos. You speak very passionately about university experience. How would you address the concern? Uh, that college isn't worth the, the cost or the risk or that it might not be for everyone? Um, you know, I, I have some sympathy for the view that um, it it might not be for everyone. I do think education... Um, I do think education is for everyone at the highest mm-hmm. level you can possibly have. And it's such a... Um, it's such a privilege and it, it has made my life Every bit of education I've had has made my life richer. Every step I've taken with it. Um, I think that higher education is probably going to be restructured. Um, it right now the model isn't sustainable, so we're we're having a lot of people come in and disrupt um, the the traditional university model because we have access to great information. We have way too many people with PhDs who are not going to get professorships. So the way that information gets, if you're only concerned about getting the information, that may very well be true. As a business school student, I now think about things like, um, you know, average salary, which is very much correlated with level of education. Um, And it's, you know, we call it an investment in education for a reason, because it does, you have to calculate it out for yourself, but um, it often does lead to more financial security in the long run. And then just the the social and cultural... I think some people do go to college and just make it into a uh, four-year-long boozy summer camp. Um, And that might be kind of a waste of time, but it doesn't need to be that. The universities are places where the, the best and brightest come together with all of these different ideas and activities, it, it can really be an incredible place to be. Well, I, I think that the, the kinds of friendships that can be formed at a university, and by that I mean I don't just mean just you know uh, drinking buddies, uh, but people who are spending uh, lots of time under the tutelage of accomplished people and reading great books and talking about great ideas, that that can form the, uh, the highest levels of friendship, as, as Aristotle talked about in, in the Nicomachean Ethics. But I think that that can be uh, an idealized version. Now you're you're at your your second graduate program. Program. Are the challenges different in graduate school, or is it just more of the same and you realize that you've gone from sprinting to learning how to run a marathon? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so I have found that maybe more than undergrad versus graduate school, um, different universities have different personalities. So this will be something that maybe we'll talk about later in choosing a college, but Mm -hmm. 
Harvard was very different from Oxford, which is very different from Stanford in terms of what Catholic life looks like. So okay. at Harvard, there was um, a very rich Catholic community that was centered around the local parish, St. Paul's. At Oxford, there was a lot more diversity. Um, there were Jesuits and Dominicans, actually there were multiple kinds of Jesuits, um, and Franciscans and Oratorians. So you could kind of figure out what your niche was. And at Stanford, it's there isn't a Catholic church on campus. Um, there is still a strong Catholic community, but it, it doesn't have a home, and so it is more, um, it's more laid back, I, I would say, than, um, and perhaps even less robust than what I found at Harvard. So, so you I, have I to be more intentional then, don't you? Periods. Yes, I do. You, um, okay. I, I, I have to seek out the sacraments. Okay. Uh, and so there, there is no Newman Club or, or anything like that uh, at Stanford? Um, there are definitely, yeah, there, there are clubs. I don't know what the undergrad situation is. There is a business school Catholic club. Um, but the, the Catholic community at Harvard did weekly holy hours. Um, oh, the, the business school students get together once a week for dinner, which is fantastic. Like that's sure. I'm so grateful they're doing that, but it's just not quite the same thing. Well, I, you know, I know that there are uh, some Catholic schools that would do well to have Holy Hour once a week. Uh, also, I had a friend working in, in campus ministry at a self-identified Catholic school, and students asked for uh, Eucharistic adoration and benediction, and, and people were on the verge of saying no for fear of what it might lead to. And the fear was that oh, if... Yeah, and the fear was that this might encourage people to go into the church building when nothing was happening, and somehow that would be destructive of community. So I think part of the challenge of uh, remaining faithful at, at a, as a Catholic at a school is to finding the right kind of mentors who will not speak such nonsense to you. When we can come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Aurora Griffin, author of How I Stayed Catholic in Harvard, and we're going to talk about best practices uh, while you're at school, looking at four areas, community, academics, prayer, and daily life. And we will want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us, one 511 Text us at the same number, one 511 5483 After the show, download the audio as podcast to share with family and friends. You can go to the thestationofthecross.com for that, where you can find a resource list. You can also find the podcast on most major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Share it with your family and friends. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Liturgy of the Hours is prayed three times a day on the Station of the Cross at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. It is the daily prayer of the Church, prayed throughout the world by priests, religious, and laity. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg Thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. 
Is there a program you heard at a particular time that you'd like to learn more about, but you don't know the title or how to find it? Our online programming grid offers a complete list of shows. Just visit thestationofthecross.com and click the Programs tab at the top of the page. Here you'll find the link to our programming schedule. That's at thestationofthecross.com. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is about staying Catholic in college. Our guest is author Aurora Griffin, who wrote the book How I Stayed Catholic in Harvard. So far, we've talked about the challenges of maintaining the faith. In this segment, we're going to talk about the opportunities and resources that that are available. Aurora, in your book, you look at four areas. You look at community, academics, prayer, and then living it out uh, day to day. Let's start with community. You know, uh, Jesus was smart, and he sent us out uh, two by two. What does that suggest for us in terms of, of living our faith as members of a community it's a great place to start god is a community of of persons you know um we are are meant to be in community there is there is no such thing as being catholic not in relation to other people you know people who are called to be hermits for example it's because they've lived community intensely and beautifully and well you know there's no yes. such thing. It's just not dealing with people in Catholicism. Right, right. I mean, we're we're not. Met, I mean, an incarnational uh, religion really shouldn't be misanthropic uh, that way. What What are the the benefits? What's What's the rewards for for the effort? Because I mean, living with people is hard. You know, the the young Jesuit Saint John Berkman said, "I don't have to practice penance. I live in community." And we're told he said it tongue in cheek. I think that may be only partially true. Uh, why is it worth the effort to make to make the sacrifice to to expend the energy? Um, I, I think, uh, at least in my life, um, the most beautiful and fulfilling parts of my, my college experience were with friends. So I'll have the rest of my life. It, mm-hmm. um, what is it? Uh, C.S. Lewis has a quote about that. Like, um, art like friendship is unnecessary, but, um, uh, I'm missing the punchline of it, but basically one of the only things that that, that really matters. Right, right, and 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 who would want want to live uh, without it? What what did, what does community look like uh, look like for you on campuses that you've been on? I have almost always looked like a merry band of renegades <laughs> on a, <laughs> a in a secular <laughs> environment. Um, mm-hmm. But secret handshakes and uh, code words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah. But, I mean, you, you, you really didn't I, you didn't wear bu- buttons, you know. I, I'm an uptight Catholic. <laughs> ask me how. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we uh, we did not, but we did. Um, it was it was almost always people who um, understood the experience of being a little bit of an outsider um, as a person of serious faith at a university and the things that we had in common because of that experience were really valuable. Right. I, I find that, that bond of, of common suffering and that sense of we're all in this together and we're all going to make sure that we do our best to get out of this alive is, um, I mean, that is, that is the thrill of a lifetime. And it, 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 you form friendships that, that last across the miles and the years. And that's certainly been, been my experience uh, as a student uh, as well. Now, how, how about the, yeah, that, the academic? Right. 
Um, go ahead. Just to add one one quick point on community. Just I think this is so important. Where I have always met those friends is at daily math. So uh-huh. if if there are listeners who are trying to figure out where am I going to find these good Catholic people when I go to to school, you can find them in a Catholic club and many other places. But a great way to find those people is by going to daily mass and seeing who's there. Right. Right, because the people who really do have the habit of going to daily mass, that never happens by accident, uh, and usually there's some measure of, of cost and commitment involved as well. Because if that mass, they're not doing other things that other people might ac- ac- accord uh, the honorific of being useful. Now, how about the academic right. part of it? I, I said, I mean, I, I was a professor. I taught philosophy and theology for for many years. What's the role of academics in supporting the life of faith? Hmm. Well, the Catholic Church in particular just has such a strong, beautiful intellectual tradition, you know, and, uh, one that is so rich that we can draw on. So I think that academics can help us learn more about our faith, um, mm-hmm. and that there's, there's nothing to fe- that we have nothing to fear as right. people who have the truth. So right. you can learn about any subject and not worry about actually losing your faith. There's, I, this is very Aquinas, right? But um, truth isn't going to contradict truth. So it, you may end up getting in over your head, um, but there will always be an answer if, the, if what the Catholic Church claims is truth then there will always be a way to find an answer. Well, I, I know at very many schools, uh, intellectual history is taught something like this. You know, in the beginning, there were the Greeks, and there was Plato and Aristotle, and that's very good. And then absolutely nothing happened for a couple thousand years. And then there was a guy named Rene Descartes in the 17th century. And then we, redis- we emerged from caves overnight and and rediscovered reason and science began early Monday morning at, at 9 a.m. And that's roughly the view. And the idea that, that Catholics had anything to do with contributing to science or art or beauty or truth, that just wasn't part of the story. Did, did you encounter things like that? I did. Um, you know, and the shame about that is I was in the classics department. So, oh. you know, technically we had medieval studies in our umbrella. Um, right. I did the very unpopular thing and studied Aquinas um, and <laughs> so, you know, um, the the 13th greatest of centuries. Um, but yeah, that's I, that is definitely the narrative, and it is so unhistorical. Um, you know, if you're going to be an atheist, like at least be well read and honest about it. You know, <laughs> admit how much. Uh, Christianity has shaped what we have now. Uh, well, you know, I, I read, I wrote an article, I think, a, a year or two ago. That, you know, there used to be a better class of, of atheists. You know, I mean, at, le- mm-hmm. at least Bertrand Russell put on a tie before he slammed the faith, uh, and and he was certainly well read. Uh, how about in in terms of, of prayer? I mean, if you're going to be a faithful Catholic, you it doesn't make sense to say, I'm a faithful Catholic, but I don't pray. That's like saying, I'm married, but I don't talk to my spouse. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and yet, you know, uh, uh, time management and energy management are matters of life and death for a college student. If you're serious about your studies and if you're in a rigorous program, certainly both apply to you. You've been in serious programs. You're serious about the studies. How did how did you make, make those pieces fit? Mm-hmm. You know, um, this is where I learned a lot from Opus Dei. Um, I am not formally affiliated with them, but I do, I just learn tremendously from their model. It's um, the work of God is what that means. And so what you're, what you're being taught to do is see all of your life, um, especially your schoolwork, um, as prayer, as prayerful. So Mm -hmm. that, that was something I think that really transformed the way that I approach things because it's not, it's not like I have study time and then I have prayer time and I have, it, th- that's true. I do try to schedule things out in a reasonable way, but our whole lives can be prayers. Um, right. 
And St. Paul says that, too. That's not an Opus Dei thing, I guess. Right. And, of course, the, the, the Jesuit axiom is to find God in all things. So it's not like we, we leave God and then go to the library, or we leave God and sit down at our keyboard to start writing. Uh, God is always present, and we can find God in doing research and having intellectual conversations, etc. Are are there books that you would recommend, or or texts or essays that were especially useful in supporting your faith intellectually that you can recommend to our listeners? Oh yes, um, one one that I keep on my shelf that I think is just excellent is um, Peter Kreeft. Practical Theology. Um, so this is uh, his summary of different practical theological questions from Thomas Aquinas. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of thick. It's not something you would... It's a reference book. It's not something you would read front to back. But intellectually, I've just found that um, really helpful. I And I think it's accessible for people who haven't studied medieval theology. <laughs> Right. Uh, I, I would recommend, uh, a French Dominican wrote a book in the 1920s called The Intellectual Life, Its Spirit, Method, and Conditions, uh, Sir Tianger, I think his, his name was. And that's something you can read front to back and then refer to it throughout your, uh, through your academic career. I know in the book you make a, an important point of having Sunday really be Sabbath, rather than, say, recovering from your, your hangover on from Saturday night and trying to catch up on homework on, on Monday. How are you able to do that? That takes discipline and planning. Um, and mm-hmm. you have to do it a few times to realize how important it is. Um, mm-hmm. But I found in college that the natural rhythm is Thursday, everyone's starting to think about the weekend. Friday already sort of is the weekend. Saturday, people are going out, and then Sunday is, oh my gosh, I haven't done anything since Thursday. I need to get all my work done right now. Right. And um, it really is, it might be the most, it's one of the most countercultural things about being Catholic in the secular world, is you have to set this different rhythm where you really are working and getting all of your errands and everything else done the rest of the time. And then Sunday you take um, to dedicate to to God and to um, how he wants to heal and minister to you through um, rest and uh, liturgy and time with friends. But when you do it a couple times, you say, wow, this really changes the whole week. Well, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, if if we live from Sunday and we live for Sunday, that can be a, a sustaining reference point for us, and we can begin to plan accordingly. Now, you, Rory, you spent at least uh, some time at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., uh, my alma mater, and some of our, our, our listeners have been uh, texting and saying, what difference does it make? to be at a Catholic school if you're a student serious about the faith and what difference does it make to be at a Catholic school that itself is really serious about being Catholic? Mm-hmm. You know, this it was such a privilege to work at the Catholic University of America. It is such a privilege um, mm-hmm. because I, I actually didn't understand that uh, before. I was... Mm-hmm. Um, I had never been to a Catholic school um I have never attended a Catholic school, so I didn't realize what I was missing. Um, and then I was uh, I was working there, and there were multiple chapels throughout these classroom buildings uh, with the Eucharist present, and students were, you know, showing up to the March for Life together. Um, it was really it was, it's something to behold. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's. I think it can maybe be one of the toughest things to be a serious Catholic and attend a school that's nominally Catholic and not serious about it. But right, there, there's an element of bait and switch. A real Catholic school. Yeah, there's an element of bait and switch that you have to be on guard against, and if you're discerning. Uh, 
going to a school that's cap that calls itself Catholic, you have to really look under the hood. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Aurora Griffin, author of the book How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard, and we're going to have advice for prospective students and parents looking at Catholic schools, and we will want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us, 1-877-511-5483. Text us at the same number, 1-877-511-5483. After the show, you can download the audio as podcast to share with family and friends, the station of the cross.com, or most major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Father Jacek Mazur. Please join me in a prayer to St. John of Canty. We ask you, St. John, to take us under your care. Obtain for us those indispensable gifts without which we would be unable to fulfill the tasks that God has given to us in his divine plan. Obtain for us from God that special favor which we so fervently desire, and above all, the remission of our sins, a continuation in his grace, and a happy death. Amen. Please pray with us this act of consecration of the human race to the sacred heart of Jesus. Most sweet Jesus, Redeemer of the human race, look down upon us humbly prostrate before thy altar. We are thine, and thine we wish to be. But to be more surely united with thee, behold, each one of us freely consecrates ourselves to thy most sacred heart. Many indeed have never known thee. Many too, despising thy precepts, have rejected thee. Have mercy on them all, most merciful Jesus, and draw them to thy sacred heart. Be thou king, O Lord, not only of the faithful who have never forsaken thee, but also of the prodigal children who have abandoned thee. Grant that they may quickly return to their father's house, lest they die of wretchedness and hunger. Be thou king of those who are deceived by erroneous opinions, or whom discord keeps aloof. Call them back to the harbor of truth and unity of faith, so that soon there may be but one flock and one shepherd. Be thou king of all those who are still involved in the darkness of idolatry or of false religions. Refuse not to draw them all into the light and kingdom of God. Turn thine eyes of mercy toward the children of that race, once thy chosen people. Of old they call down upon themselves the blood of the Savior. May it now descend upon them a laver of redemption and of life. Grant, O Lord, to thy church assurance of freedom and immunity from harm. Give peace and order to all nations, and make the earth resound from pole to pole with one cry. Praise to the divine heart that wrought our salvation. To it be glory and honor forever. Amen. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after the show, visit our page for The Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. You'll find a link to today's episode page where you can view Father McTague's show resources and today's podcast. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. We've been talking about staying Catholic in college, and our guest is Aurora Griffin, author of the book How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard. We've talked about the opportunities, the challenges, the resources, the allies, and the possible dangers of trying to live faithfully as a Catholic on a college campus. In this segment, we're going to look at how to make a good discernment. If you're a prospective student, if you're the parent of a prospective student, how do you know what's the right place for, for your young person to get the best benefit of higher education and at the same time have the person not only maintain their faith, and but grow in their faith. Aurora, you said you grew up taking the, the faith seriously. Harvard's not an, an obvious choice, is it, for, uh, for growing in, in the faith? How did you come to decide on Harvard? <laughs> um, the, that's a, a kind of funny story. I, I knew I wanted to go to Harvard um, when I saw the movie Legally Blonde at 10 years old. Mm-hmm. So... Um, the protagonist in that story is um, a woman who goes to Harvard, and I said, "Well, that's it. That's uh, that's what I'm going to do." <laughs> and then I did it. So I, it was uh, Harvard or bust for me. But um, my parents, at some point, had I think 
wanted me to go to a Catholic college. My dad was involved with Thomas Aquinas College in California. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, I mean, speaking of a, you know, really serious Catholic school, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I, um, I knew that that just wasn't uh, for me. I knew that I wanted to get out there and, uh, you know, honestly, like maybe fight with people a little bit about it. I don't, I don't mind being um, that person who's a little different. Okay, uh, and and that would make yes, I think that would be an essential feature if you wanted to um, be a, a faithful Catholic while while uh, while at Harvard. Uh, so, what's your advice now to uh, to students who are saying, well? You know, I'm graduating from high school the end of May, the beginning of June. I got to start filling out applications. I'm not a hundred percent sure about uh, wh where to go next. How do you how do you have a sense of what's a good fit? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that that's... so. The first question you have to ask yourself, right, or, or I that I would as um, a Catholic. Um, thinking about where to go to school would be, do I want to go to a Catholic school or not? Um, and that is based sort of on your personality, which is what I was getting at um, earlier. Am I somebody who can, who in my faith, you know, if, if this is a priority for me, in my faith, I need people around me who are going to be supporting me, and there are a lot of options with, with different circles who are serious Catholics to be friends with, or do I want to be in the kind of place where um, I'm being challenged, and that's how I, I grow. Um, okay. And that's just a personal choice, and that's and it also varies with where you're at in your own life and your own faith. So right. that's that's one question. And then the second question is if you if you know you want to go to a Catholic school, um, you know, they, if, just because the school calls themselves Catholic does not mean uh, that they're going to provide students with... Um, an authentically Catholic experience. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, alas, that happens to be true. That. Right, yeah. and that's why I, I would encourage uh, prospective uh, students and their parents go to the website for the Cardinal Newman Society, get their guide to Catholic schools, so that you can know what to look for and what questions to ask. Aurora, we have a caller on the line, Julie from Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Catholic Current. What do you have to say to us today? Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to affirm something, Aurora, you said earlier about attending Mass is a good way to become acquainted with the Catholic community at your school. I went to American University, which is secular, um, and they had a Newman Center there, and that's how I began. And, you know, I had other students encourage me to come back. It was great to go to Mass at 1030 at night. It was unusual for me and interesting and fun. Uh, and Father, what you said before about it being a more obligatory it really became a, a good community for me, and it led to my participating in other things like prayer groups, uh, retreats, and that kind of thing. And then when later in life, after I had been to graduate school, I was at Princeton, and um, they, I went to Mass there when I was on campus and working, you know, and able to get, get to daily Mass. And um, there was a prayer group. It happened to be all men, but it was a time when I had a real difficult time for me. I was pregnant, and had learned that my um, baby was just not going to make it, uh, and having all kinds of pressure to have an abortion, and um, oh. just saw myself in this wonderful prayer group of men in this, like, old building at Princeton, and it was just wonderful, and it all came from coming, going to Mass. It's an easy first step, and, and just, you know, pray for the desire, uh, the grace from God to, to, to desire it. And well, thank you for your witness, Julie. Uh, Aurora, did you go on retreats when you were in college? Um, first of all, thank you so much, Julie, for calling in and, um, and affirming that and sharing that. Um, I did go on some retreats. Um, there, I tended to go with, um, I, I, again, I mentioned Opus Day. They have weekend retreats that, um, that you can go to that are very silent and um you know, prayer based. Since then, actually, I went on an eight day silent Ignatian retreat. This was last mm -hmm. summer, and it was life changing. Um, 
So I wish if I could go and add a, a chapter in the book, it would be about Ignatian spirituality, because I, I just um, <laughs> I think it's such a fantastic way to um, to understand how to live Catholicism in the modern world. Well, you know, as a Jesuit, we certainly encourage brand loyalty uh, in in that regard. <laughs> yep. um, what what about the practice of, of campus visits? I mean, did you visit Harvard before you said, "Yeah, this is for me. I'm ready to sign." I, I spent the summer there when I was in junior year of high school, so I knew okay. that it was a good fit. Okay. But you can tell a lot by going to a campus. Where where are the chapels? What do the students talk about? What do they look like? Can I, you know, can I really picture this being somewhere where I can grow? Aurora, we, we've got about a minute left. Do you have a word of encouragement to uh, young people and their families discerning schools? Oh, absolutely. You can stay you can stay Catholic wherever you go to college, wherever you work, wherever you find yourself in the world. Um, that is the beauty and privilege of being Catholic. It's the universal church and um and she will reach us wherever we are. God and the church will and, and God will reach us wherever we are. It's a matter of um putting ourselves in a place where we can receive that. Um Thank you so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Aurora, we're very grateful that you took time to be with us today to, to talk about your, your journey and your testimony. And we encourage everyone to uh, read Aurora's book, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard. And she's got some interesting videos on YouTube as well. We commend those to you. Uh, friends, we're grateful that, that you uh, spent some time with us today. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern, here at the Catholic Current. Tomorrow, we're going to address the question, must Catholics reject capitalism? Very challenging topic. I encourage you to go to alitea.org today, A-L-E-T-E-I-A.org. Look for my latest column. It's a second look, a somewhat jauntous look at the issue of New Year's resolutions. I propose something different. After the program today, go to thestationofthecross.com, look for our resources list, download our audio as podcast. You can also find our podcast available on most major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Share the good news with your family and friends. Start a conversation. Through the intercession of Our Lady Mount Carmel, may may God bless you. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace, and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.